I, I have a story to share because I was thinking about what some of the other speakers had said. And when I was in graduate school, I was talking with a professor because I was interested in working with him. And he said, have you ever considered business or law? And I said, well, no, business is a little too cutthroat for me. And I said, and law would require too much reading. No, I want to be an engineering professor. And he said to me, a black woman with your verbal skills could excel in business or law. And I said to him, so what you're telling me is that the people who can't communicate are the ones who are to go on to be our professors. <laughs> so needless to say, I didn't work for him. And, and that was OK, because he probably wouldn't have worked for me. But um, let me just get started here. I am going to have to refer to notes from time to time. As an engineer, um, we, we like charts. We like charts and we like numbers. So while you eat, I'm going to have some charts and numbers up there for you to give you a little bit of my reflections on black women, not in science, I'm sorry, black women in engineering. I'm going to stick to what I know, OK? Black women in engineering. Science and engineering are very similar in some respects, but they're also very different. The numbers of people in engineering are considerably lower than the numbers in science. So I'm going to stick to women in engineering, black women in engineering. And I'm going to refer to my notes from time to time because I have lots of numbers here and I want to make sure I get them all right. So let me just get a little bit adjusted here. Now some of you may ask, now you're not going to ask anything because I clicked ahead. Let me just try to get this screen. <laughs> like an engineer should be able to figure out the technology. A should is the operative word in that sentence. Some of you may wonder what is engineering. And I'm going to read some definitions of engineering to you. And then I'm actually going to read something else to you that's a little bit better. So I went to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary online and it said engineering is the application of science and mathematics by which the properties of matter and the sources of energy and nature are made useful to people. And I thought that was a good one because when Dr. White told me that the topic of this conference, it was, thank you, told me the topic of this conference, she said it was research and praxis. And listening to everyone speak this morning, I realized there's a very big difference between engineers and people who read books for a living. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have the heart to tell her I didn't know what praxis was. <laughs> I'm crying, but it was just so funny. So while she's talking to me on the phone, I'm typing in on Google Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> now we have some faculty members from Princeton here. So I also went to WordNet at Princeton.edu. And it said that engineering was the practical application of science to commerce or industry. So that was a good thing. And I said, ooh, practical application. That would be praxis. <laughs> Okay. And then it also says that there's a second definition. It is the discipline of dealing with the art or science of applying scientific knowledge to practical problems. And that's what we do as engineers. We apply science. We apply science to solve problems. Now, Dr. White told you that I got my bachelor's from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. It is the oldest engineering school in the U.S. And back in November of 1924, Stephen Van Rensselaer wrote a letter, and I think it was to the legislature, saying, I have established a school, and the dots say, he says, on the, on the shores of the Hudson River or something like that. I have established a school for the purpose of instructing persons in the application of science to the common purposes of life. My principal object, object is to qualify teachers for instructing the sons and daughters of farmers and mechanics by lectures or otherwise, 
in the applications of experimental chemistry, philosophy, and natural history to agriculture, domestic economy, the arts, and manufacturing. So engineering is not just for techies. Engineering helps us to solve problems. There's a place for everybody in engineering. And we're going to have to do a lot of good engineering to get out of the mess that we are in right now. So you may ask, what makes an engineer? What does it take to become an engineer? And one of the things that makes an engineer is curiosity a curiosity of how things work. And an example I'd like to use is my daughter. And I just want to mention that uh, if I look a little tired, I had adventures in travel yesterday. I, I came to this conference and I didn't come alone. I'm a mother and I prefer not to leave my family, so my family has come with me. Both of my children are here, my husband's here. And my parents who live in New York City, they're also here. <laughs> And my brother took the day off from work, and we'll talk a little bit more about him later. <laughs> my brother, who works in New York, um, took the day off from work to come here, and he's a, he's a very busy person. And he came because he wanted to heckle me. No, he came <laughs> because um, he wanted to hear me speak. And I just want to point out that um, he's got to be on a plane tomorrow morning headed out to the West Coast. So. It's just fantastic that my family is here to support me. And that's, yes. That's, and when you start to see the numbers that I'm going to show you, you understand that sometimes it's family and that's the only thing that keeps us going. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my daughter, Naomi, who's going to be six a week from today. Naomi has a curiosity about things. And last summer, she had an ice cube in a glass. And she was wondering how she could keep that ice cube from melting. And she said, Mommy, I need an ice pack. So I gave her one of those blue ice packs. And she put the ice pack on top of the glass. And I said, no, 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 Naomi, you have to put the ice pack on the bottom because it'll keep the ice cold. And she says, no, I, I think I can put the ice cube on top. I mean, the ice pack on top. You know, you don't, you don't want to crush the enthusiasm. So I said, okay, Naomi, we'll put it on top. But well, why don't we get another glass and put another ice cube in and just see how it works? And she was very confident about putting that ice pack on top. So a half hour later, we came back to the kitchen table, and Naomi's ice cube with the ice pack on top had barely melted, whereas the other ice cube was, was almost totally water. And I looked at it, And then I did what engineers do. I came up with theories. <laughs> and I realized that hot air rises. So as the air in the glass got warm, it rose up, touched the ice pack, and then came back down cool. So she had set up convection there to keep the ice cube cool. So it, you, you say, well, is my daughter going to be an engineer? No, we're going to talk about that later. But it takes a certain curiosity to be an engineer. you, you just got to be curious about how things work. Also, you have to have a love of math and a love of science because you have to take a lot of those classes. And then a lot of it has to do with just what you're exposed to. Some people become engineers because it's what they've seen. And I'll tell you a little bit about my parents. My parents are both teachers from the New York City school system. They're both retired now. My mom was a junior high school math teacher. And if you ask my mom why she, didn't, why she was a math teacher, she said, well, it's what I could do. And my father... Um, had worked, he had been in the Army Air Corps, and then he went on to uh, teach aviation mechanics at Aviation High School. So you say, well, I was destined to become an engineer with a mom who's a math teacher and a dad who does mechanical things. And maybe I was. But I also have a brother and a sister. My sister was unable to come today. And I'll tell you about that. But um, <laughs> with parents who were teachers, we said, we're never going to teach. Never. Well, the reason my sister, my sister went to Hampton Institute, it's now Hampton University, she majored in psychology. And then she went on to Wake Forest for a master's in education and counseling. And uh, then became a special ed teacher. <laughs> Is it better if I speak down here? Oh, okay. Because it sounds very loud to me. 
Um, she became a special ed teacher. Not only did she become a special ed teacher at Jane Addams High School, she ended up being special ed math teacher. And the reason she can't come today is because she's a guidance counselor down in Baltimore um, at Baltimore City College High School. So my sister's not an engineer, but she's a teacher. Now my brother, who had been a football player in college and majored in sociology, and I, I thank him for my becoming an engineer because as a kid he teased me a lot because I had no common sense. <laughs> and he's smiling because he knows he said that. <laughs> and the reason I'm holding on to the podium is so that I can get my my mouth consistently at the right distance from the microphone. Once again, being an engineer, solving problems. Um, my brother said I had no common sense, so I worked hard to get common sense. <laughs> and my brother went into sales, and all I knew was he was a salesman. He had sold Shocks and Springs. Then he worked for a distributor of Aveda products. Then he was East Coast sales manager for Aveda, and then he moved to Minnesota. And after that, all I knew was he wasn't living with me, and he didn't ask me for money. <laughs> and then one Christmas, something happened, and I saw his business card, and I said, oh, you're a vice president of sales. I said, you're pretty important. He said, yes, I am. So, <laughs> but he, he's a very modest, a modest guy. So before I, I prepared this presentation, I said to him, what exactly is your title? And he said, he's, he's a modest guy. You would never know this, but now you know because I've told you. But had you met him before, you would never know. He's actually vice president of sales and education. <laughs> education for uh, L'Oreal. And I just bring this up because although we're not engineers, we haven't fallen far from the teaching tree, okay, as far as apples. Now, when you look the other way, you say, okay, well, maybe engineering is something that's inherited. And I've got my two children. I told you about Naomi. Naomi, the ice cube Naomi. She wants to be an astronaut when she grows up. And I was trying to think of where that came from. And we spent, we've spent quite a bit of time at the, uh, at the planetarium because in Tallahassee it gets very hot in the summer. She had to figure out someplace cool to take the kids. And it's a great place because mommy and daddy are exhausted, so we sleep during the planetarium movie. But, um, so Naomi wants to be an astronaut, and I have a son, Charles, who is eight years old, and he's also a terrific kid. That is my unbiased opinion. Charles would like to be an animal conservationist, and he loves big cats, lions, tigers, leopards, and he'll point out that a cheetah is not a big cat. Um, and we wondered where that came from, but then we remembered when he was little, the window in his room at, at our old house was where he could look out, and there were two neighborhood cats, a white cat that would sit in a tree, and then another cat, um, I'm not good on cats, it had spots. Um, <laughs> there was a cat that would walk under the window, and his first word was cat. So maybe what children become is a product of their exposure. But um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get back to what I'm supposed to talk to is, is about <laughs> I gotta look at my notes, because if I don't, I'll forget. And you guys know, those of you who teach, the days you skip your notes are the days you go off somewhere else. <laughs> and there's something on this keyboard that is super sensitive that is just driving me crazy, but we'll, we'll live with it. Let's take a look at women engineering professors who are black. And I'm gonna say black because African American has gotten us into some trouble. In the effort to be politically correct, we have African-American. And there was a student in my class one time, and I said to her, you didn't check the box. You know, because there was something going on. There was some scholarship program, and she didn't apply. I said, why didn't you check the box? And she said, well, I'm not African-American. I looked at her. She was black. <laughs> it turns out she wasn't an American citizen. She was from the Caribbean. OK, so we, we have to be aware of the words we use and the situations that they create. Also, when I was in graduate school, a postdoc came to our lab from South Africa. So it was a white man from South Africa who, when he became nationalized, naturalized, sorry, naturalized, see, we don't, we don't pay attention to little words. Um, when he became naturalized, he's going to be an African 
American. So just think about that. But what I'm going to do is take a look at PhDs in engineering. If we look at the year, if we take a look at the year 1980, the year I started college, there were about 2,500 PhDs awarded in engineering. If we take a look at the number of degrees that were awarded to American citizens, we can see that that's about 5,500, or 63% of the PhDs awarded. If we look at the number that are awarded to African Americans, we see that that number is only 18. And if we look at the number of black women who got PhDs in engineering in the year 1980, there were two. <laughs> two. And they account for 0.8% of the PhDs awarded in engineering that year. What I'm going to do is, I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to click on these that much, okay? I'm going to fast forward to the year, okay, slow forward to the year um, 1984, the year I graduated with my bachelor's. Um, nationally, 2,900 American citizens has dropped now to 52% at 1,500. African Americans are at 15, and there was one. I think she was the one that was at the graduation ceremony, the commencement ceremony that I attended. If we look at the year I graduated from MIT with my, my PhD in 1992, we are now up to about 5,400 PhDs awarded in engineering by U.S. universities. African Americans are at 2,500. We are now below 50% of the PhDs awarded by American universities. I'm sorry, American citizens. African American number has now skyrocketed to 49. <laughs> and the year that I graduated, there were six black women who received PhDs in engineering, accounting for over one-tenth of one percent of the PhDs awarded in the U.S. And finally, the last year for which NSF has, has statistics, the year 2006, they just haven't published the, st the statistics. We are now up to about 7,200 PhDs or doctorates. Some of people get science doctorates. In engineering, we're up to 7,200. Americans are now at 2,500. We are at 34.6% of the PhDs in engineering that are being awarded. African Americans are now, um, well, we'll say, yeah, well, they're black Americans are now at 103. And the number of black women has increased significantly. It is up at 42 black women. And that's great, because now we can say that since they started keeping statistics, there are, I'm sorry, since they've started keeping statistics, there are now 367 black women. Let me make sure I've gotten that number right. There are 367 black women who have gotten PhDs in engineering. Somehow that number doesn't sound right, but I'm going to go with it. It's 367 or 347. What I, I think it's 347. Whatever the case is, there are approximately 350 of us out there, and there are 371 engineering schools in the country. We don't even have enough black women engineers to have one per school. And I am at the FAMU FSU College of Engineering. It is a joint college between Florida A&M University and Florida State University. I am there. There is another black woman who works part-time as an instructor. And then on campus in computer and information systems, there is another black woman with a PhD in engineering. So we have more than our fair share at three. <laughs> there are schools across the country where there are no black women professors. What I'm going to do is show you the trends from when NSF has started publishing the data in 1966. Now, uh, Dr. Hammond talked about some data being suppressed. I wanted to come to you today and tell you exactly how many black women professors there were. I can tell you rounded to the nearest hundred, there are 100. The number of full professors has been suppressed because there are fewer than 50. The number of associate press professors has been suppressed because there are fewer than 50. The number of assistant professors who are black women has been suppressed because there are fewer than 50. But let's take a look at the numbers. These are the number of, of engineering doctorates awarded from 1966 through 2006. 
you see that we've gone from just over 2,000 up to just above 7,000. If we've superimposed on that a line showing the degrees that are awarded to American citizens, you can see that it, it fluctuates, but we're staying pretty stable there at about 2,500. The important thing to realize is that back in 1966, American citizens accounted for 80% of the PhDs being awarded. Now we are at 35%. Whereas foreign nationals have grown from 20% up to 65%. Now I don't want to get in trouble like Oppenheim did. Um, I'm just going to say these may have some implications for our national security. But there are implications for those of us who are African American or black women professors. Because in engineering, we need graduate students. And there are a number of graduate students who would prefer not to work with a black woman. My husband said to me, well, you've got to tell them the story about that graduate student. Uh, she was working with another professor and something she was doing in the lab didn't work. It involved ceramics. And ceramics is a little more than pottery. There are <laughs> ceramic materials. <laughs> I know some of you are thinking, yeah, also toilet bowls. But <laughs> Um, but if you ever look at the power lines and you see these things that look like, they look like uh, pottery type bells, those are insulators. There are ceramics that the computer chip is on, it's on a ceramic package. Um, she was trying to do something with ceramics and her advisor knew that that's what I had studied for some time. And he told her to email me and I read her email and I emailed her back and told her well what she was doing wasn't quite right and there was another way to do it. And she, she um, let me just say she was a foreign national, I won't tell you which country. She emailed me back and told me that what she was doing was just fine. Okay, and that's the way she was doing it. So I emailed her one, time, one more time and I explained to her that you can't do this this way because I just told her why in the email. <laughs> and I got no reply. Then about three weeks later, she emails me back and said, oh, I heard you went to MIT. I want you to explain to me how it's supposed to work. Okay. Needless to say, all I said to her was, I sent you an email on that already. <laughs> so looking at the engineering doctors that are awarded to foreign nationals, um, that just lets you know in terms of trying to get graduate students who will work with us, it can be a little difficult sometimes. And I'm going to lean forward. I know it's not great posture, but I have to work with the mic I have. Now, if we take a look at the engineering doctorates awarded to um, black American citizens, and I'm not including um, black people from Africa, it would take a long time for me to actually go through and separate out. And many of the Africans who receive doctoral degrees will stay and go on to become professors here and now count in the statistics as black Americans because many are now um, naturalized citizens. The first thing I want to point out to you is I had to change the scale because had I put the number of doctorates awarded to black Americans we'd be hugging zero. So I've changed the scale it no longer goes from zero to 8,000 but from zero to 120 you can see the progress that has been made in the degrees that are awarded to black Americans. And if you look where black women are, you can see that it's the pink line. We are making some progress. Where the line is discontinuous, those are the years where none were awarded. Okay, those are the years when none were awarded. And then you may say, well, maybe it's just that women don't go into engineering. What I'm showing you here is the number of um, doctors that are awarded to American women, that number has gone from zero up to about 575. So now there are about 575 American women receiving doctorates in engineering. So I've, what I've done now is I've plotted the number of women that are receiving doctorates and we can see that minority women, it's about 75. That includes not only black Americans but also um, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders, but not Asians, because they're not underrepresented. And you can see that um, the scale is a little different for the minority American women. The minority of American women account for about 12 to 12.5% 12 of the doctorates awarded to 
um, American women, and black women account for about 7% of those that are awarded to American women, 7.5%. And I just want to show you the breakdown once again. We've talked about what's happening with black men in colleges. Um, much of the progress that has been made in recent years is in the number of black women receiving PhDs in engineering. What I do have to say is it does, has nothing to do with ability or intelligence. Some of it may have to do with the job market because jobs were easy to find. I expect that we'll see this number increase significantly over the next three years as some students are unable to find jobs. Now, if you look at this, you'll wonder, what are we doing to feed the pipeline? Where are these black women engineers going to come from who are going to get PhDs? Well, if we take a look at, once again, this is, um, this is data from the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering. I credit them for increasing the number of engineers in the late 70s and early 80s. It started off with ME3, Minority Engineering Education effort, I think, that changed to NACME. You can see that across the board we have about 6,500 degrees being awarded in engineering. This goes from 1977 through 2005. The data is spotty. The data are spotty. Proper English. The data are spotty early on. Now, if we take a look at this, American citizens account for 92% of the bachelor's, at the bachelor's degrees that are awarded in engineering. So I'm going to just put the uh, foreign nationals. Women have gone from almost nothing up to about 12,000. So women engineers were getting about 18.5% of the bachelor's degrees are being awarded to American women. However, if we take a look at the numbers that are being awarded to black Americans at the bachelor's level, it's hugging the, the zero there. So we can see that out of the 65,000 degrees that are being awarded, Approximately 3,000 are being awarded to African Americans, and only 1,000, closer to 1,100, are being awarded to black women. So black women account for about 1.6% of the engineering bachelors being awarded. Now I see you guys are glazing over, so what I'm going to do is click really fast through to masters. Okay, masters, you guys know, is the degree between the bachelors. I want to point out that not every PhD student will get a master's first. Um, the important thing is remember, with the bachelor's, Americans accounted for 92% of the degrees awarded. At the master's level, Americans only account for 56%. Okay, so Americans are not necessarily going on for master's degrees. And we've got the foreign nationals. Women, we've got just under 5,000 women who are getting degrees in master's degrees in engineering, and that is about two. 12, I'm sorry, 12 percent. We take a look at the numbers for black Americans getting degrees, master's degrees. We see that that total number is about, and I just have to check the scale there. Um, we've got about 282 black women, and the total number is somewhere around 800. What I've done is I've pulled this all together to show you that, show you the trends. The gray bar shows you the percentage of engineering degrees at the bachelor's level being awarded to black Americans. We've gone from essentially 2.8% up to 4.8%. So we've increased, but not nearly enough. What some people will tell you and some universities will tell you is what the black enrollment is. Okay. And black enrollment is, is great. But engineering tends to have an attrition rate in excess of 30%. Okay, in some universities it's even higher. And it's, it's because sometimes calculus isn't what we thought it was. <laughs> the master's degrees awarded to black Americans started off around 1.5% of the degrees awarded, and now it is 2.6%. The numbers are going up, but the percentage isn't going up. And the doctorates have gone from about a half percent up to, I'm sorry, have gone from about a half percent up to 1.5%. 
What I'd like to show you are the trends for black women and pay attention to the scale. The trend for bachelors is looking pretty good. Our trends are looking good, but the overall numbers are still quite low. Of the 65,000 engineering bachelors awarded in 2006, 1.6% were for black women or to black women. Of the approximately 34,000 masters in engineering in 2005, less than 1% were awarded to black women. And of the 7,200 doctorates that were awarded in the year 2005, less than one half of 1% were awarded to black women. Now some of you may be upset by this. And I've already told you that generally there are fewer than one of us per school. Now we haven't even talked about how many per department. Because at the College of Engineering, we have five departments. I am the only tenured black woman in the College of Engineering. You'll say, well, oh, that's great. I'm the only one who's on a tenure track. Because the other one works in the dean's office part time as an instructor for general engineering. But what I say to you is, we're alone. Okay, you gotta let me finish the line, okay? <laughs> we're alone, but we're not lonely. And the reason why we're not lonely is we didn't wake up in this situation today. When I went to RPI, they had 4,000 undergraduates. There were approximately, and this is a tough number to deal with and figure out, but I think there were about 250 minority students. What I do know is in my freshman class, we had about 1,000 students. We had about 100 minority students. And I keep counting, and I, I'm thinking there were 12 of us. But I'm only coming up with nine. Okay, so it may have been 12 minority women, not 12 black women. The class before us was doing significantly better. They had about 20. Okay, 20 out of the 1,000 students. When I got to MIT in 1984, we got something very, very helpful from the Associate Dean of the Graduate School's office. It was a minority student guide. That guide contained the list, a list of all of the minority graduate students at MIT. It had our names, our departments, our undergraduate institutions in our hometowns. Then they subdivided us into black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans. But the guide was very helpful, and at the time they would also give the president's report and show the trends on the number of students that were at the school. And thanks to urban studies and the business school, the number of black students at one point had been as high as 125. So out of the 4,000 to 4,500 graduate students at MIT, we got as high as 125. But the rest of the time I was there, the number of black graduate students never exceeded 100 out of 4,000 graduate students. So when I say we're alone but not lonely, when I started in my department, there are approximately 300 graduate students. Four of us were black. And at one point, I was the only black graduate student in my department. And at that point, I thought there was something that needed to be done. So we started recruiting. And then that number came back up to four. Because one of the things we found is that the black students who applied to the Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT, some years, we had two applicants. And all two of them were accepted. So we found that we had quality applicants. We just needed to recruit students. Um, so, we've been alone for a while. And one time there was a meeting that we had with other women graduate students. And the white students, white women graduate students in physics were very, very upset. They were upset because there were no role models for them in their department. 
There were no white women faculty. Actually, there was one. It was Millie Dresselhouse. I mean, I, I, she was there. And the black women graduate students looked at them. I think there may have been four of us in the room. We weren't all from materials. We were from out there. And we said, well, what did you expect? We knew that we weren't going to see any black female professors. When I was there, there was one. She was a visiting professor in math, Iris Mack. I can remember this because she was the one. Okay, we didn't expect to have role models at our university. We didn't expect to have mentors that looked at like us. We knew because we had gone to school undergrad and we didn't have black female professors. So once again, we're alone, but we're not lonely. Now one thing that we do experience are challenges. So I found this really nice slide. <laughs> and then I modified it for this talk. Because we have a balancing act and we have hurdles that we have to overcome. There's the research, the teaching and the service to get tenure. But many of you have spoken about being spread thin with committees. Now remember, most engineering schools don't have a black female faculty member. So when they do, every committee wants one. I mean, every committee wants the one. I've already talked about the problem of graduate students, where sometimes graduate students may not want to work with us, but other times they do. There's also the issue of credibility with the students in the classroom. And that's one of the main reasons that I went to MIT. Now, have I always wanted to be a professor? No, I wanted to be an astronaut. Then I wanted to be a roller derby star. <laughs> That's when my parents stopped taking us to roller derby. <laughs> and I wanted to be a cheerleader. Oh, I forgot the important thing. After the astronaut, but before the roller derby star, I wanted to be a crossing guard because that was one of the most important people in the world. Then somewhere in there, I wanted to be a lawyer. So the reason I went to the Bronx High School of Science is, yeah, I like math and science, but they had the best debate team in the city of New York. I'll say the best debate team in the state of New York. I'd say they had the best debate team <laughs> in the U.S. And I found out in my forensics class that I am not a debater. And it was good that I learned that early on. So then I decided that I'd be a chemical engineer. I went to college and I... I didn't like that too much, so I ended up doing materials. And I didn't say end up, actually I did materials, because I could see it. Materials engineers look at how the atoms are arranged in things, well, those are actually the material scientists. Materials engineers look at how things are processed and how that affects the properties. Okay, and the example I'd like to use for my students, some of you will remember this. There was a product called Dynatrim. Do you remember that? It was like SlimFast. I don't know if anybody ate it, but we all saw the same commercial. Depending on, you could mix it and it would be a shake. And if you mixed it really fast, then it would be like pudding. And then if you mixed it really fast and put it in the freezer, it was like ice cream. Okay, so um, material science and engineers, we look at that. How can we process things to make them the way they should be? And when things don't work, why don't they work? But I, I think I digress there. Um, I became a materials engineer because we looked at how things were and then we got to break things. That's what we do, we break things. And um, one of the reasons I went to MIT is I decided that I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to get students excited about things. And I decided I had to go to what was perceived as the best school in the country. So in the old days when I was an assistant professor, I'd introduce myself to the class and tell them where I went to school. And then I'd say, I'm not like the professor on Gilligan's Island. Those in here, I'm not like the professor on Gilligan's Island. I don't know everything. And if you want to play stump the professor, it's not that hard. So let's just stick to what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> See, sometimes you guys know this. When you get a PhD, you know what that means. That means that at one point in time, you were the expert in something. Doesn't mean we know everything today, but at some point in time, we were the expert in something. And no one's ever going to take that away from us. <laughs> so getting back to uh, graduate students and students, sometimes there's a little credibility gap. For those of you who don't know, Florida A&M University is a historically black college. 
And Florida State University is a predominantly non-minority university that was founded as the Florida College of Women, but it had a name before that. But it is a predominantly non-minority um, university. So we get students from both, both sides. And I think it's a perfect place for black faculty because black students need black professors, but white students need black professors also. Because the only way we're going to work things out here is if we all learn to learn from each other. So I'm in a unique position. Um, what happens sometimes is my colleagues will walk up to me and they say, Simone, you just got to talk to this black student. I said, well, why? Well, the student has a problem. And I said, okay, so every time a white guy walks in my office, I got to send him to you? <laughs> and see, so the whole point is sometimes people don't realize that the problems students have have nothing to do with the color of their skin. Okay, sometimes the problem is actually the professor, because many of you know this is the only job that we can get without having a single day of training. <laughs> My students are surprised to find out that we have never had any teaching instruction. <laughs> they said, didn't they teach you guys how to teach? I said, no, we sat in class for many years, and they think by sitting in class, we know how to teach. Now, I, I see the time's getting short, so let me just say, um, some of the challenges we have, we have challenges of finding mentors. But for black women engineers, it's not a problem for us, because... We've been doing this a while. And we know that if we want to get where we need to be, we may need to have three or four mentors. We have to find someone who has the job that we want and have them coach us. Then we have to find the person who is a woman who will help us to deal with some of those other issues. And then we need to find a person who's black who's going to help us with that stuff. And we haven't even talked about the person's values. So, find, so if we had to find a black woman who has a career we want and the same values, we'd be very sad people for a very long time. <laughs> and we could blame a lot of people for a lot of stuff. But remember, we're engineers. We solve problems. And we say, okay, how am I going to get done what I need to get done? And then those of us who have been there for a while and maybe have gone into industry, we also learn that if we want something, we have to give the appearance of giving something. I said give the appearance of giving something. <laughs> because we cannot get through this alone. And that was one very good thing about my department. When I entered my department, my department chair believed that every junior faculty member should have a mentor. But we didn't get full professors as our mentors. We got associate professors. And they would not become full professors if we didn't get tenure. Okay? Because a person does not deserve to be a full professor unless they can mentor someone through the ranks. Now, I will say, I will say that didn't work perfectly because in one instance, the two careers were separated and... Uh, twice because that person's career was not tied to helping someone else. I, I said he. Oh, I can say he because I'm the only, no, now there's another woman in my department. So there are now two women in my department. Um, it, it works very well if you have associate professors as the primary mentor for assistant professors because they both have a vested interest in the success of that assistant professor. But, um, I don't know, I got lost there. Um, well, let me just say, you know what? Things haven't been all that bad. Despite all the things that I have said that, you know. <laughs> we have had, okay, uh, time, time, yeah. I'm going to be, oh, you got to ask questions. Okay, we've had women do many great things. John A. Parker, I met her when she had just graduated from school. She was an ASME congressional fellow, so she was advising congressmen on science. Okay, we've got a woman who's an associate department head at Texas A&M. We've got, an, and Paula and I were in graduate school together. Okay, so um, she's done a lot better than I have. She's department executive officer. I think that's like associate chair or, or business manager for chemical engineering at MIT. 
We have a department head, Valerie Taylor, of computer, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Texas A&M. Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies at Virginia Commonwealth, Stephanie Adams, Stephanie G. Adams. I believe her father was instrumental in increasing the number of blacks getting masters in engineering and then going on to get PhDs in engineering when he founded the National Consortium for Graduate Degrees for Minorities in Engineering. Oh, GEM, GEM program. Okay, at Virginia Tech, we've got Bev Watford, who's the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Over down at uh, NC State, you've got an Associate Dean, Christine Grant. At Norfolk State, you've got the Dean of the School of Science and Technology. And I almost thought I would have to grab a physicist for this last one, a physicist who is now at RPI. But I managed, oh, sorry, I left someone out. And this is for the young lady from uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. We've got Janet Rutledge, who's interim vice provost of graduate education. We were at RPI together. So some of these people I've actually met and spent some time with. And uh, we now have a university president, Carolyn Myers, who's president of Norfolk State University. She had come from North Carolina A&T before then, and she had been a dean or associate dean in Georgia Tech. So despite the fact that our numbers are low and the lack of available role models for many of these people, and perhaps the lack of black female mentors, we have done well in making our way. What I do want to share with you, thank you. Okay, I, I'm, I'm wrapping up, I'm wrapping up. Oh, they're not taping? Okay. Okay, let me, let me just, what I wanted to say is when Dr. White asked me to speak, I did the chick thing. I said, surely there must be somebody else who's more qualified than I am to come talk. And she, I said, I know people who are closer to you geographically who have reached higher ranks than I have. And she said, Cheryl Wall suggested you. And she thinks you're the right person. But I wanted to let you know that I am not the best that is out there. I am one of many. And you can't put us in a box. Just like I can't put any of you in a box other to say that your gender is female and your race is black. We are all individuals, but we are making some strides. I'd like to thank you for having me here today. What I'd like to do is leave you with a, with a peaceful scene. Um, <laughs> I just want you to know those pictures, that picture of the, the fishing, that's actually at our neighborhood back home. This is another lake in Tallahassee, not that you should all apply to Florida A&M University. Right now there's a hiring freeze in the state of Florida. <laughs> now you can look at this as a beautiful sunset, but I look at it as the dawn of a new day. And I want to thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Okay, um, thank you. Now I will yield to my superior, Dr. White. She says we have time for questions. Now what I'd like to leave you with is another peaceful scene as we do questions. <laughs> I'm going to point out a bridge to you. This is a bridge that my children cross when they ride their bikes to school. I want to say something about my husband, who is an industrial engineer, who is a stay-at-home dad. We decided that when we had children, that we would have one job between us, because somebody needed to be home with the kids. And we said we would either, have, we would either work part-time each, or one of us would stay home. And since I already had tenure, I wasn't moving. <laughs> But one of the wonderful things that my husband has done is he's been there for our kids. And I didn't tell you about our son. Our son has been doing well in school. And he and his dad do some things together. They, they sit on the couch and they watch basketball, okay? But since Charles was small, this is the animal conservationist, Charles has always been looking at the score and saying, hey, dad, it's a seven-point game. You know, so what they do is he learned his early math skills at three and four by looking at the numbers and seeing the spread. Not only that, but it helps with multiplication because now they talk about how many possession game it is. 
because either you're going to take two pointers or three pointers. And depending on how close it is, he can figure out what types of shots should be made. But um, they get to ride their bikes to school every day. And here's the bridge. Tallahassee is a lovely place. Okay. <laughs>